property. We gotta protect it first, don't we? Before we release it. Absolutely. So why don't we start there? Because I think a lot of artists make mistakes, especially when it comes to leasing. We talked about this, we talked about this off the stage. You know, leasing tracks versus exclusive rights and that whole type of deal. So why don't you kind of explain maybe the contracts and what we need to be looking for when it comes to um, being able to release and actually monetize our music legally. Um, well, first thing you gotta understand is that intellectual property, when I say that, I mean like copyrights, trademarks, those type of rights, they're treated differently than like physical property like this. Like I could sell, okay, it's not mine, but if it was, I could sell it to Jackie, and we'd exchange money, and then the mic would be hers and the money would be mine, and there'd be no question, right? Um, it doesn't work like that with intellectual property. It has to be in a written contract. The correct language must be included. Um, and by that I mean you must specifically refer to the copyright ownership, um, not just I'm selling you a beat, I'm selling you a track, I'm leasing you a beat or a track. Like that's legally insufficient because it doesn't distinguish the intellectual property from like a physical copy of it. Um, so you gotta have your contracts in order first. If you're working with anybody, um, understand that when you're collaborating with people, you might think oh, this is my song, somebody just came in and like threw down a lyric on it. They're, or they, they were in the studio and they just like hopped up on the mic for a minute, but it's still my song. No, my friend, it is not just your song anymore. Um, you'll find that out when that song starts making money and that person is like, hey, that's my song too, right? And it's not just the money, it's the control. That person now owns an equal share of the rights as well as the revenue. So if they wanna release it for free, they can and you can't stop them. Think about that for a minute. They can license it out in any way to use in any affiliation that they want that you would object to. The only obligation they have to you is to give you your fair share. Um, so we stop all that from happening by using contracts that are written in such a way to control those rights, to make sure that you get the deal you want with your work, that you have control of your work. That can be done with work for hires, it can be done with a collaboration agreement, um, if you're purchasing the rights to something, an assignment, um, or if you're just getting permission to use something then that's a license, which somebody might call a lease, but the term we actually use is a license. Um, but yeah, all of that should be in writing and we've gotta use very specific, correct language in it. Um, otherwise, you can get in trouble. And um, that's, that's one of my big things is avoidable problems. I see so many avoidable problems. I see so much avoidable harm in this industry. Like people come into me and they're like, ugh, thing happened. I'm like, that didn't have to happen. We could've stopped that. Now we can't because it's done, but we could've stopped that. Um, and so that happens when you know people don't seek advice or when they um, use stuff they find on the internet. Treat things you find on the internet just like the advice you get from Web WebMD, right? Because <laughs> according to WebMD, you're all dead, right? Like, <laughs> I'm sure. No, you're not. But you find templates on the internet, can you tell what's missing when you look at it? Do you know what jurisdiction it was written for and what year? A lot changes, so it's probably not any good. You just found something for free. So that's that's the preliminary stuff. Secure your rights before you monetize it so that you get all the money you're entitled to. Great. Well, now that we now that we got the paperwork taken care of, now we released it. How do we make revenue from that? You know, that's the biggest thing. So I want to go to Rob Smith, got 38 platinum records. So he could talk to us about that. All right, so I want to give like, uh, I want to talk about somebody because he's been in, uh, and I want to get just real quick two different scenarios because I come from a retail space, which is for the young people out there, record stores, people would walk in and buy tape cassettes, CDs, and that physical piece was, what, 1999 at one time? At Tower Records, $20. Anyway, so during that space, there happened to be a point in time um, when they start talking about piracy and you know taking away from print material and all these things in our business. And all that was was basically setting you up to get ready to put your music on a new plantation. I don't want to call it that, but that's what that was. Because in generalization, print will never stop. You can't go to Burger King and buy a Whopper. The only way you know is because of the print. You know these golden arches and McDonald's. So just to say, 
uh, offline, online in comparison, it was the change. Now that we do have where you see Spotify, iTunes, and all of these uh, scaling stream from eyeballs and clicks, you know, uh, one person that I saw actually, and I was with that I saw actually knew how to make money is in the heat all the time. And that's Brian Williams, which you guys know as Birdman. And I was on the road with them for two years prior to the time of them getting their deal. And the one thing that I can access that he did is that he understood market share. And this was then. Because we would go into certain markets, and I remember um, he ran at Militon, but we would go in certain markets. These markets might have 300,000 people, it might have 400,000. It basically used to be Louisville, we would go to Jacksonville, we would go to Nashville, all the Vills for some reason, I don't know, um, a lot of Vills. And then we would go to Houston and a couple other little places. But these low 